Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today's webinar. I am Saukartika from TSI and I will be the moderator for the session. Today we are presenting API Builder presented by Prasad. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the session, please click on the hand raise button so that you will be unmuted to proceed with your questions or you can enter your questions straight away in the question chat box. Now without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Prasad. Our presenter today is a principal architect who has been associated with TSI for an year and who has overall of 18 years of experience. His forties are open systems, Java enterprise application, developing medium and large uh, scale applications, architecture for development and re-engineering the applications. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all across the globe. This is Prasad here. Uh, today, uh, we're going to see about the API Builder feature, which we're going to have in TTFGI in the upcoming 1.3.8.4 release. I just give up introduction on myself. Uh, I am Prasad Padmanabhan, principal architect, looking for products of modernization. So um, I will have a background from an open systems, uh, developing applications uh, for medium large scale and re-engineering the applications as well. So let's move on for the agenda today. Uh, so API Builder is basically a, a Swagger document generator which we're going to have uh, for building APIs. It's a contract. So today's agenda, we're going to see, we'll, we'll give a background on what is Swagger and then what is API Builder and then how it's integrated with TPF GI and what it contains and a small demo of the feature that we have today. So to, to understand how API Builder, just I'll give a brief on what is Swagger. A Swagger document is the REST API equivalent of a visual document for a SOAP-based web service. So the architectural style which we have on the SOA, SOA architecture, mostly will be used on the visual file. So, but today applications are, have, application actually need rapid development, which uh, actually requires REST API equivalent and microservices architecture is the need of the day to day. So with this Swagger document, we will have a REST API equivalent of a document, a contract, which requires for two systems to interact with each other. So ideally from a TPF system, when we want to communicate and collaborate with external systems, so we need a, to create APIs. So, so when, when we say about Swagger, since it is REST based, so we need list of resources, we need the references, and an URL pattern which required for the REST API to work. So, so Swagger document can be built uh, to call on those resources as well. So we have this HTTP operations which will be defined on the Swagger document itself. Said that the Swagger document will be either on a JSON format, which is a JavaScript object notation format, or an YAML format. Uh, it's a it's it, it's an YAML ain't a markup language is the extension. So this is the base of a Swagger. And then let's look at a small uh, basic structure of a Swagger document. The Swagger document requires uh, some metadata information like the Swagger version which is the API definition version and also uh, some other metadata information which will which we will be adding to the header header information of the document. And also they require a base URL wherein that base URL will be the say for example the project directory uh, path. So that's the base path. And also, it requires the system name and schemes. So when we say schemes, it, it is like a, a HTTP or a HTTPS scheme, and also the system host and a port and the base path is required. Also, when we when the two systems, two parties want to communicate, either one party will be consuming and the other party will be producing. 
So we need to specify what are the MIMB types that these two parties require to, to communicate with each other. And the next is the path. So when we say path, there are different methods. I mean, these are since this, this is based on REST API. There will be HTTP methods which we will be defining. Uh, so the HTTP methods or operations which we call and also which are the endpoints we will define over there on the paths. And also the parameters uh, which we pass uh, to, to acquire a resource. So these parameters can be passed via the URL path or as a query string or in the request body. So and also we will specify the format of the parameters and other information as well. And when we say the request requires parameters and also we will get a response back, right? So we'll define the possible status code which are the HTTP status codes, uh, 200 or 404 for not 4 and 200 for OK and response body schema as well. So we will be defining those on the response file. And when on the input and output model, we'll define certain sections. Say for example, uh, it may be a simple type on the parameters, like an integer or a string, or it can be an object. So as an input, an object as an output as well. And also, we can reference the schema uh, to validate the request and response parameters as well. The next is the authentication. Authentication is, is, is ideally needed for the security purpose, right? So when we want to when we want to call it as a REST service, we actually support uh, the HTTP authentication, which is the basic uh, key that we give, and then the API key, which is which, are, which can be passed as a token on the header or the query parameter or input key. And also the optional auth2 as well, with where we can define the scope of the authentication, like read and write as well. So this is the background of a Swagger document. And so what is that to do with the API Builder? API Builder is nothing but a Swagger editor, which we have provided in TPF GI. API Builder actually assists to build a Swagger document with a, with a browser, which can embedded in GI itself. So, uh, the API uh, Builder gives a side-by-side -side view whenever, I mean, we, we actually add the information. So it also provides a view of this uh, Swagger document. It gets generated, uh, I mean, dynamically. So it, it actually provides a view on the right side itself. And also, once the document has been created, there is an option to validate the document. And also, the document can be loaded into the developer system itself. So that these are the features that API Builder provides. So how the API Builder has been integrated? So API Builder has been added as an add-in in GI, and also there are easy steps to navigate to the API Builder. So when when we open the API Builder, the list of projects that is already available can be selected from the application, and then there is an option to open up the DFDL SSD schema. And also, if there is already a service JSON file available, uh, that is also can be loaded. And also, once the once these are loaded, well, the developer can actually add the required fields and parameters. And then, once the Swagger document is ready, it can, I mean, up upload it back to the development server itself. So that's how it's been integrated in GA. Okay, as we said. Uh, API Builder is used to create Swagger documents. So the API Builder contains uh, several tags, which has a header where we say we, we enter the uh, metadata information, and also the MIME types. Uh, we'll see about that in, in a few. And also the path, which we discussed uh, the path of the resource. And then the HTTP methods that we have. And then the definition. definition uh, we'll see in detail because this definition will have the request and the parameters and the response parameters. What types, whether it is simple types like integer or string or uh, the object, or it can refer to a schema itself. So these are the definitions that we will see. And also the security types that we saw, basic, app key, and then um, AP key, and then OAuth2 
So these are the security options, and also we can tag this API in order to uh, in order to expose it to a client. So on the header part, uh, it, it requires some information info about the API. Uh, there can be a description what this API is, is needed for, and also so on the info part there can be a description and there can be a version and we can provide a title for the API and the contact and the licensing information can be. Host is a mandatory field wherein the host is nothing but the system that is going to serve the API. It will have either the IP and the port information of the system which, which is going to going to expose the API. And the base part is is the path where the API is served, uh, which will be relative to the host, and uh, it, it will have an information of the API, wherein the uh, operation can be called from this base path. So these are mandatory fields. Mine type, mine type for, yeah, there will be producers and consumes part of the API, wherein we will be able to specify the mining type. Uh, as an example, uh, we can have application JSON, application XML, or application object, which are HTTP MIME types which we have. So we can specify this on this uh, path. And definition, uh, definitions are the object. Say uh, it can be a simple type like integer string, or also can be an object type which will be produced or consumed by the operation. Path is again a required field where it defines the uh, path of the API which we will be specifying and also the HTTP method can be get, post, put or delete. So, uh, and also an operation ID. Operation ID is a unique ID uh, which has to be specified for the API. Uh, in this example, I mean, we, we are seeing price flight. I mean, usually uh, it can be an add user or it can be get user or get all users. So this will be a unique ID which is for that particular operation. And the parameters are uh, to send the, the actual values to, to query, uh, to, to pass it to the API. So we have the operation ID, we have the parameters, this is the body. I mean it also can refer uh, to a schema. In this uh, example we are referring to a ticket request schema wherein all the request parameters are specified in this in the DFDL request XSD. And similarly for the response uh, we can we can specify the response values directly here or also we can refer a schema uh, like ticket response the DFDL file XSD for the response uh, schema itself. So this can be referenced as well. In the operation as well. Um, before uh, we go into Q&A uh, we will see a small demo of the application. Okay. I have opened the uh, GA and I have a demo project and the API builder icon will be part of this add-in tab. Let me open the API builder. So the API builder will be opened in an embedded browser so, and it will have all the tabs that we just discussed. The header tab, main tab, security and paths and definition. And on the header tab, when I say select project, I will have this, all the projects that are listed here. So I will have multiple projects listed here. So I can choose a particular project. And the file, the schema file and the service uh, JSON file, which is already available in the project will be listed here. So I will be able to select those files from. So the files are loaded now. Uh, into this application, but we will see, I mean, where it exactly gets used. On the right hand side, if you see, we have the Swagger and the version, this is the API specification version, Swagger 2.0, and also the version 1, and there is a base path as well. So we have the basic info, wherein these are the basic info for the API which uh, will will actually um, enter and create the API. So these are mandatory fields and also you can see when I uh, type the title and the description, the uh, right side it's a JSON document which will be updated as, as, as when, uh, whenever I type on the information. The API developer can specify their 
details. These are optional fields. And also, we can specify the licenses. And on the host information, so this is also a mandatory field and the base part. And the protocols, which can be selected as well. Multiple. And if there is any documentation required for the API external, you can specify it here as well. If you see on the right hand side, all this information will be created as a JSON. Let's go to the MyMe type. We have two uh, areas. One is consumes, the other one is produces. MyMe type, the default application JSON. Also, we can have multiple selects here. And on the security definition, we can have basic object uh, key, something like this, or the API keys, which can be passed as a query parameter or in the header token also the authorization we can define the scopes as and tag definition we can provide the tag definition on the description on the path so an operation id so will be a unique id and we can provide the response parameters here so here when we import fields we can provide a response or a reference here and it can be a simple type as well or if we want to import fields so this is where we actually open the project right the file so that will be available and we can have the response schema the schema that we have and we can select the information from the schema and the properties as well. You can add if needed. And these are the HTTP methods or the operations that we can define that are just used to get. You can have multiple operations as well. You can have post, put and delete as well. And on the definition, again, I can create a new definition. As I said, I mean it can be a simple type or we can import the files from here. And on the parameters, we can pass the parameters as well. Okay. We can have the request. And I mean, we define responses on the pass as well. We can, we can define the responses in definitions as well. So these are simple types again. So once we have added the information, uh, we'll be able to view uh, the information for the specific tabs here. But when we want to see the overall Swagger document, we can say Swagger view. It will give a preview of the document. So the developers can and will be able to copy and save it as a separate file. Or if they want to upload it to the path, they can validate and upload from here. So what, this is the Swagger JSON that we created. Uh, using the API builder. So the Swagger JSON uh, is required uh, whenever the developer actually creates the API and when they want to expose it to the other clients or to an external world, uh, they'll require the uh, contract, right, the Swagger document. So uh, that is where the Swagger JSON is required. And also uh, the Swagger JSON can be created first and then can be uh, can be given as a contract to those two parties. And then I mean they can develop the API uh, with this uh, with this JSON file itself. So it can be used both ways. And um, the service JSON which we actually selected, uh, if the API is already built, the service JSON will be available. But if the API is not built, I mean. Um, the information that is required uh, for the for the for the creation of this wagon can be entered manually by the developer themselves. So uh, that's part of the demo, and um, uh, we can we can start with if any questions uh, we have on on API builder feature or uh, where it is used, why we need Swagger, any questions on that. Um, Prabhat, we have few questions and we have a question from Ed Varas. 
Shreshwaras, I'll unmute you. Please uh, proceed with your question. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I got a couple of uh, doubts. <laughs> um, first of all, when when you uh, said that you uploaded it to the the uh, server, um, can you show me the TPF system that you uploaded it to? Because I seriously doubt that I'll be able to see it if I do a ZM Des display on the console for that server and see that that Swagger document is in fact there. Uh, when I upload it, it will be on the Linux box, the developer environment, which which the file is available, and it can be loaded to TPF system as well. Yes, it can be loaded to TPF as well, but it would have to be put into a TPF load set and the uh, associated descriptor file uh, would also have to be there as well as uh, the uh, DFDL uh, inbound and outbound. So those four items would have to be loaded into one load set and then activated. And then after it's been activated, uh, it would have to be deployed with another Z entry. Are those included with this tool? Uh, those are not included, Chet. Yeah, but that, that's actually what uh, the developer has to do. Uh, so this is uh, into their uh, developer environment is where, where the file is uploaded right now. As you said, all the DFDL schemas and the uh, service files, and then along with that, the service uh, Swagger JSON also to be loaded into the TPF system. That is correct. Okay, the second thing I had, uh, and I wrote it in a question to you, is the creation of the actual descriptor file itself. Uh, you called it something else, but basically it's a JSON file that associates the um, operation ID to the TPF program name that's going to handle this particular uh, request from the HTTP server. That descriptor file uh, uh, is a companion to the Swagger document. Do you have a tool to create that? You mean the DFDL file or the descriptor no. file? The descriptor file. The descriptor file itself. Uh, you just uh, you went and just clicked on one. I don't know how it was ever created. Currently, I create it at the same time in Toolkit when I create the SAR document. The SAR file, and then of course my Swagger. Uh, I have to go to a different tool to import that SAR file, and then it it uh, generates my my Swagger. I, I appreciate the fact that that you're um, not having to have a SAR file in order to create your your uh, Swagger. So I, I can appreciate that. But I'm curious as to how you generated that descriptor file, if in fact. Um, the, I mean, you clicked on it and imported it into your tool. I just don't know where its origin was. Okay. That descriptor file, file uh, I mean, was already available there when, uh, when a developer will create an API, right? So that will be created earlier, but the API builder actually doesn't require that descriptor file to be created. Yeah, but I have to have it in order to load it on TPF. So that, that's right, the right. Right. missing link. Uh, I would still have to use my toolkit in order to generate that file, which would be very uh, non, uh, it would be a, yeah. uh, Agreed. a, a hole. Um, yeah, agreed. The other thing that I saw uh, for our normal REST API Swagger development, uh, this tool looks very great. However, IBM uh, has not uh, deployed everything uh, for REST. So one of the things that they currently do not support is parameters. So even though you built those nice parameters inside of your Swagger document, the path parameters are not um, usable for TPF. Okay. I mean, you mean to say uh, they have developed it with uh, the Open API 3.0 version? I'm just saying that they currently do not support path parameters. 
So any parameters that I would have that, that needs to go in, either you have to um, uh, pass it inside of a yet another header, just like you did for your security header, and then mm -hmm. you'd have to have an ability to map within your Swagger tool to map it to the body before DFDL is able to translate it. And that was my last question I have for you. Do, do you have anything in this tool that allows you to map header files or header um, name value pairs into your body of your, of your document using your Swagger? You mean header information into the request body? Yes. For both the request and the response. Currently, that's how we pass our HCA parameters uh, that is uh, required for security on TPF. Uh, our HCA application takes those parameters and knows what that particular agency is allowed to do and not do and how they want their, what core they belong on and, and how they want their AAA set up. All these type of things are done through SOAP parameters that we pass through the the uh, uh, five different headers that we pass in addition to the security one. Okay. Yeah, and we'll be able true. to do that, but currently, I mean, yeah, we, we actually pass specifically the parameters, but we should be able to do that. I, I'll make a note of it. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Patrick, I have to you. You can proceed with your question now. Yes, I, I do have a few questions, but um, what Chet was saying is that in, in Toolkit, you can uh, correlate a uh, DFDL to the swagger and then basically do a drag and drop to say, hey, this field correlates to this field. But TPF, the system itself, doesn't even take that into consideration. It, it looks at the field names listed in the swagger for the requests and responses and then maps them according to what they match to in the DFDL. Um, but I do. Uh, he already mentioned that the path path parameters are not supported at all on T, on TPF right now. The only uh, parameter types supported are header, query, and body. Um, I did have a question around the use of that XOAD type. I did a, I did some research. It looks like you guys are using Open API Designer as your web tool. Mm -hmm. And so, have you guys tried loading that Swagger to TPF with those XOAD? types in the Swagger because I'm, I'm, I've never heard of that and I don't know if that's a supported type that TPF can use. I know TPF does validation against the Swagger whenever you deploy it. And I was wondering if, have you guys loaded one of these Swaggers to TPF yet? Uh, we have uh, loaded the uh, sample what we have developed. Uh, the XOAD type uh, we haven't tried yet. Uh, yeah. Probably, yeah, we'll, we'll try that out as well. Okay, and um, I have one more question. Um, or actually, this is more of a statement. Um, one of the things that I found when I was building REST APIs for TPF is that we have we have a ton of systems, uh, you know, test systems and uh, customer test systems and whatnot. And putting the host for each and every single one of those swaggers to be the host of, you know, uh, in that swagger would be, you know, we have to have one swagger for each system and update the host. What I found is that. Uh, TPF does not require host in, in, the, in the Swagger document. And if you guys want to, you can load a Swagger to TPF. And what, what it'll do on the deploy is it'll go ahead and, and add the host to the Swagger. So that, that'll just be dynamically populated based on what, which host you, you've deployed the Swagger on. Um, I found that to be the case. I also found that if you just leave it blank, that it'll cause control fours whenever you go and try and retrieve the Swagger. But... Um, but yeah, that's all I got so far. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. Yes, we have a question from Mark. Uh, Mark, I have unmuted you. You can proceed with your questions. Mark, you can proceed with your questions now. Hello, can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes, yes. Thank you very, yes, very much. One, uh, first and foremost, you guys have made terrific progress on this, and I, and I can't thank you enough, and I can't compliment you enough. Um, to make it to get us over the finish line on this thing and to use this, I would very, very much appreciate if you'd work with both Chet and Patrick 
and and uh, take care of the issues that they have mentioned. And if you get that worked in, one of the real key ones is, is we do have to be able to pass those host connectivity adapter, the HCA uh, parameters, and we're, we're getting that all laid out because this select header information, if we can't get that into the HTTP header, we can't make that work. Um, as a part of this too, yeah, um, you guys are working so very hard on our uh, on the whole tooling aspect for Travelport and Delta. The move to production process that allows us to take the ZREST, this swagger, the uh, uh, REST service descriptor file, the daffodils, load those as a load set, okay? I'm sorry, the daffodil file, that whole set of information really needs to be integrated with our move to production that you've created for us, okay? So that with a, a simple load uh, setup or a click, whatever you want, everything that's produced, the swagger, the REST service descriptor file, the daffodils, the whole kit and caboodle can be set up as a load set and integrated nicely. If you'd work with uh, Chet in particular on that, that would be a really, really, you know, getting us over the finish line, a big help on that. And then finally, uh, again, what you've done here is get us so that we can now produce these uh, the swaggers and actually hopefully uh, get to the point where we can integrate it and actually produce daffodils as well. One thing that would be exceptionally ha uh, helpful, and I've asked IBM for this as well, and I'm, I'll lay it out, you've got us with this swagger document creator, Hip Hip Hooray, this is huge. What we'd really like to be in a position to do, if you can extend this, and I know this is a bit of a jump, but we produce on the consumer side, the client consumer side from our OTM, the Open Travel Alliance uh, you know, compiler and modeler that we have, we produce Swagger client documents, okay? What we really need to do, and this is something that I've, I've uh, sent an RFE to, to IBM on, is to say, take that thing right there and import that into this document so that we can produce not only the um, uh, the producer swagger document as you've done here, but also the ability to, to produce up the daffodils that would um, that would allow us to take the inbound message that has been you know that's defined by that swagger document and get the uh, the daffodils produced for that or at least roughly produced in, so that then we could go and finalize that daffodil. And uh, so then what we end up with is going from a client swagger document produced by another tool, we could actually produce everything we know or at least get a good skeletal set of the items that we need to load as a load set into ZDPF. That's that descriptor file, the swagger, I'm sorry, the swagger, yes, as well as the uh, the daffodils. This would be a natural and a very helpful extension to us on that. Um, does that make sense? Yes, sure, sure, Mark. Thanks for the feedback, and we will sure work with Chet and Patrick on this. We'll 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 extend that. Sure. Okay. And if you would on that, um, there's one final thing that Chet can really uh, um, help you with in terms of guiding you on. As you can imagine. We're coming in right now, and we're using a nice Open Travel Alliance API that we go produce the swaggers from, and that's going to be our consumer side. That's a pretty big deal. What we're doing is we've got some new services where, no worries, we can take exactly what you'd be producing, uh, that which you've extended for us here, and what I've asked you to extend, okay, and then go access new services. Terrific. But so much, 99% of what we're going to be doing is bridging right there in the, 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 the ZTPF producer, right there in the REST producer. We're bridging from the new world, our open API, this, o, um, this open distribution API that is being represented here by the Swagger document, okay? That's going to get mapped to the old services, the old KLR, the old DIR, the old terminal. And we're doing that by setting up a a structure to structure map. As you guys know in ZTPF, when this message comes in, it goes through daffodil and goes through rest, and it produces a binary object 
that, re that is really representative of a binary object that represents the JSON that came in, okay? Well, that's never in the, the format or the layout to get us to our legacy services. So we're writing a wrapper program. We call it a structure-to-structure -structure map that literally picks that thing up and says, gosh, let me now map this to the legacy object. Okay, that's our structure to structure map. So we can fire it in, go process it, the response comes back, and then we do the reverse through a reverse wrapper. Okay, that infrastructure, if there's any relief that you can offer us there that would extend this yet one more item that says, oh, yeah, let me come up with a template. You point to a header, a header file of the legacy. Here is the new, uh, the new uh, binary object that came in that's the TPF binary object produced by the REST producer. Now let's drag and drop the fields from the, um, uh, the, the REST object to the legacy object. That's the cat's meow, and that completely, completely completes the needs that we have for getting from old to new and back again or in this case, new to old and back again. It's a hobbit's tale. It's a hobbit's tale. Yes, yes, Mark. That's right. So uh, couldn't be more pleased with what you've done. This is just absolutely wonderful. And with these enhancements that Chet and Patrick have spoken over to get us over the, we could start using it, and then to extend it two extra notches uh, so that all of that we could take a swagger from uh, another model that's been produced, import it into here, get all the uh, ZTPF producer artifacts produced, and then that cat's meow to allow us to bridge, that, to help us frame up, to help us get that rough swagger. I'm sorry, not the wrapper program built. Wow, that would get. That's just that's just a cat's meow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mark for the feedback. Yep. Thank you. I will any way possible with you on these additional extensions and supply you with the same information that we supplied to IBM. Um, anything that would help you do that. And we would uh, be very happy to be, quote, a sponsored user of that in, in IBM parlance. So uh, uh, we'll help you with that. OK? Hey, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. You bet. I'll shut up now. A gentle reminder to all the attendees, if you have any questions, please click on the hand right button so that you'll be unmuted to proceed with your question, or you can enter your question in the question chat box. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, I'll just give some credits uh, who all helped to develop uh, this feature. Um, I want to thank uh, my lead, Shankar, and my team. Um, and then uh, on the integration part, Ed Jordan and Jeff Longwell as well. Um, and uh, last but not the least, I mean, um, my director, Nagaraj, as well, for giving us the opportunity to develop this feature. Uh, Prasad, it looks like we have answered all the questions. Uh, thank you, Prasad. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. A short survey will open up. You can specify topics for the upcoming webinar session. We will send you webinar follow-up email within a week's time which will contain the link of this recorded session. If in case of any queries, contact customer support executive or write to product info at ppfsoftware.com. Thanks again for joining us today. We have webinars followed on second Wednesday of every month. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining.